It's Bob Hoopscher, and this is the Gaining Perspective Podcast, where we bring you insightful conversations with some of the top thought leaders in the investment advisor profession and investment management industry. I am the founder of Advisor Perspectives and a vice chairman of Vetify. Managing volatility is a high priority for advisors. The right investments can stabilize a portfolio and dampen volatility while keeping goals on track. Increasing bond allocations used to be the standard way to reduce volatility, but with bonds more correlated to equities, their diversification value has decreased. And with high inflation, bonds aren't providing enough real income for many investors. Demand for private credit has increased because of its low correlation to traditional equities and bonds, and its enhanced income potential. And as an asset class, private credit has a history of resiliency throughout economic downturns. And that was true during the pandemic, as well as last year, when those types of loans largely held up in contrast to the bond market, which had historically bad performance. My guest today will discuss how advisors can reduce volatility, increase income, and diversify equity and bond allocations through private credit and other alternatives. Michael Reisner serves as co-founder, co-president, and co-chief executive officer of Scion Investment Group, as well as co-president and co-chief investment officer of both Scion Investment Corporation and Scion Aries Diversified Credit Fund. And he also serves on the investment committee of CIC and the investment allocation committee of CADC. So, Michael, tell me about your career path and what led you to found Scion. Sure, Bob. Well, first, thank you so much for having me. Do appreciate it, and uh, thank you to all your listeners. So, yeah, so I was um, I was in private practice as an attorney here in New York, and I came in house back in geez 2001, I believe, to the predecessor company of Scion Investments. Um, in 2008, coming out of the global financial crisis. My partner, Mark, and I had the opportunity to kind of buy out the company and change the way the company was headed. Um, At that point, we were fortunate enough to have the foresight to realize that there were not too many companies out there that raised capital for illiquid alternative investments from retail investors. In fact, I think our average ticket size was about $30,000, $40,000 a pop. And at that point, a lot of people thought we were crazy. The big alternative investment managers, you know, they were raising $100 million plus from sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, you know, you name it, all these institutional uh, capital providers. But we recognize that, you know, not only were there not many people doing this, but in terms of the baby boomers getting uh, older and needing to rely on income products, doing something in an illiquid wrapper um, really could be fortuitous. So we bought the company back in 2008. And we've built it up to where we are today, where we have a uh, very successful business development corporation traded on the New York Stock Exchange, where we originally raised all that capital through the financial advisors and intermediate ne- intermediary network. And we have a uh, diversified credit interval fund, which is just approaching $4 billion in assets right now. So we've been very fortunate. Well, I'm going to ask you about both of those funds, the BDC and the interval fund later. But let's start off with um, some background on Scion. I know it's long been a proponent of access to alternatives. How do you define alternatives and how has that opportunity evolved? So, you know, I think it's a good question. I think a lot of people still to this day equate alternative investing with risky investing. And it certainly could be, don't get me wrong, but that's not really the case. And that's not the way we look at it. We look at alternatives as anything that's somewhat illiquid, that doesn't necessarily have a QCIP, that can't be traded in, traded out. Um, So in that regard, when you think of the typical alternative investments, it's now private credit, which isn't traded off a syndicated loan desk. It's private equity, it's infrastructure, um, and things of that nature, real estate. But obviously, there's also esoteric assets, you know, baseball cards, crypto, uh, stamp collecting, wine, those could be alternative investments because in many cases, they're not liquid. Um, but as I say here today, I'm more focused on what I consider traditional alternatives, 
private credit, private equity, real estate, and other types of real assets like that. So what has been the growth pattern of alternatives over the last few years, and what has been the key drivers of that growth? So again, it's twofold. I think you have to go back maybe 10 years ago. You know, these products are sold. They're not necessarily just bought. Um, there's still really an educational gap where financial advisors don't really understand them. And for many years, there was a, a high front end load associated with them. And for better or for worse, that uh, I think led to a little bit of a stigma where a lot of the global investment managers didn't necessarily want to be associated with that type of front end load because it, it stigmatized the product. Through regulatory changes and evolution, those front end loads and fees have come down. And not too dissimilar from the mutual fund industry 40, 50 years ago, when fees go down, obviously a lot more interest um, goes into these products, a lot more assets flow into these products. So I think starting about 10 years ago when the fees came down, you had a lot of the bigger, more household names, uh, the Apollos, the Aries, the Blackstones of the world, enter the space. And then people said, well, wait a second, maybe getting alternative capital from retail investors, 30, 40, $50,000 a pop, maybe that's something we should look into and explore. So that really jump-started it. Um, more recently, and you talked about this in your introductory comments, you know, for many years, financial advisors just, they were trained in terms of the 60-40 model. And that was it, and that was gospel, and that always worked. And it does always work until it doesn't. And obviously, you know, last year showed that they don't always um, – naturally hedge each other, that sometimes they do move in sympathy, whereas alternatives could be a real stabilizer. So I think financial advisors that maybe never looked to alternatives, never thought they needed it in their practice, now have taken another look at it. So I think the combination of lower fees, the bigger alternative investment managers, and just the markets kind of normalizing a little bit um, has really led to the growth of alternative investing. What about the investment vehicle that you use, the, old, the uh, interval fund? Describe briefly how that works for our listeners who may not be familiar with it and what has been the key advantages that it offers as a uh, driver of growth. Sure. So, you know, kind of what I talked about earlier, alternative investing, in my definition, just means investing with limited liquidity. That allows an investment manager to take the illiquidity risk and presumably deliver an illiquidity premium. Um, the interval fund has really been around for years. It is essentially a mutual fund. It is governed by the 40 Act. It is highly transparent. The one novel feature of it is liquidity is given at certain intervals. Um, in our case, and I think in a lot of cases, it's on a quarterly um, interval. It doesn't have to be. It could be annual. It could be semi-annual. Um, but what that has allowed many investment managers to do is now take a highly transparent wrapper a highly regulated wrapper in terms of, you know, independent board of directors and or board trustees and um, the 40 Act governing it, but putting it in a wrapper that kind of protects the investors from themselves, doesn't allow a quote run on the bank and panic selling, allows an investment manager to invest from a, for a longer term perspective. So it's kind of an exciting wrapper. Um, we think it could do maybe for what what ETFs did to equities. Interval fund or tender offer funds could do for alternative investing in terms of allowing the masses, um, the retail investor, the financial uh, advisors who heretofore haven't accessed certain asset classes to dip their toe in through this interval fund wrapper. So the key is that it's matching the uh, liquidity of the underlying investment, the private credit or private equity funds that are typically gated with the liquidity of the investment vehicle that you're offering. Yes, and that's what we like about it. I do think there are some asset managers out there that just like the li limited liquidity, and they might put liquid assets in there, and that's a risk that uh, an advisor or an investor has to understand. But yes, you hit the nail on the head. If you could take a, an illiquid asset or relatively illiquid asset and put it in a relatively illiquid wrapper that is now highly regulated, highly transparent, that pretty much anybody can access, that potentially uh, could be a game changer. How do you approach distribution? Uh, you, you mentioned you work with advisors. What is your strategy? How do you reach out to advisors? How do you educate them about your offering? 
So yeah, it's, a, it's another good question. You know, I, I said before, these products have to be sold. You can't have a wholesaler just walk in there and talk about how Apple or Google are your biggest holdings or Morningstar gave you five-star ratings. Um, there's still such a huge education gap. Um, I think as we sit here today, I saw a recent study, uh, only 26% of financial advisors think they're knowledgeable about private credit. Um, only 21% of financial advisors think they even know or are knowledgeable about an, an interval fund. Um, and that requires an education. And frankly, if, if you know, the S&P 500 is going up 17, 20% a year every year, financial advisors may not want to learn about these products. Um, going back to what I said before, hopefully now there's a realization and a recognition that, you know what, maybe we should learn about these products. So it sounds trite, but it's paramount importance. We focus on education and a lot of education. We want to make sure our salespeople, internals, externals, relationship managers, they know the insides and outs of the product, um, the assets that are going into the product, what our competitors are doing similarly, what they're doing differently. So we can educate our financial advisors because ultimately they're going to have to educate their, their clients and why they should access this. So that's something we focus on, whether it's podcasts, webinars, white papers, or just from conversations one-on-one. -on -one. We want to make sure our salespeople are the most educated because at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of fintechs that are coming into the space that are greasing the skids, making access to these products easier. But at the end of the day, that, that last mile, that financial advisor to the salesperson is, we still think the most important, the most critical element. And we think we do that very well. Equities are the building blocks of any successful portfolio. From satellite exposure to core allocations, advisors must understand the best way to wield equities. Join Vetify on September 21st for the Equity Symposium and hear from industry experts and thought leaders. Register at etftrends.com slash webcasts slash equities symposium. That's E-Q-U-I-T-I-E-S. We're looking forward to seeing you there. And is your distribution strictly <clears throat> direct from your firm or do you make uh, your products available on any third-party platform? Yeah, so we, we partner with third-party platforms. We partner with the wirehouses, with uh, RAAs, both institutional RAAs, the bigger ones, which we define as over a billion dollars, and a lot of the smaller retail RAAs, and over 100 uh, independent broker dealers. So we kind of get shelf space for our products. And then once you're on the shelf, that's where the fun begins, because that's where you have to penetrate these vast networks and educate these advisors and say why you think you have a decent product that they should, they should access. What are you hearing from advisors? What are they telling you about how your products have expanded their practice and appealed to their clients? Yeah, I think, listen, I, I think it's what I said before. You need a, a wrapper that helps them, right? I mean, if you're, a, you know, if you're a qualified purchaser and you want to access a GP product with like a cat call capital, those are out there to a limited amount of financial advisors. But most of us out there don't have that financial wherewithal. And they are seeing more and more interest from their clients, right? I think as the younger generation um, inherits money and comes into money and starts using financial advisors more, they want alternatives, right? I think, you know, they're seeing the big guys use it. By the big guys, I think, you know, the pension funds are allocated 40% plus to alternatives. And I've seen the, the retail investors anywhere between 3 4% to 10%. So nowhere near that. And I think they're starting to realize that, hey, you know what? Why can't I invest like the big boys? And it used to be because, well, you don't have access. You don't have the wrapper. Sorry, you're not big enough. And that's starting to change. And I think firms like us that are bringing unique products, differentiated products um, with the right structure, the right wrapper, the right education, you know, I think that's being well received by financial advisors because, again, they're – they're in the business of making money and they want to win clients and the more value add they could deliver to their clients, uh, the better. And we want to be partners with them in that regard. So what are some of the benefits that advisors may not be thinking about? And also what are some of the risks? You know, what I said before, alternatives don't have to be risky. There could be risky alternatives out there that you might want risk reward. Um, the risk is limited liquidity. 
So if you have a client that might need money for whatever reason in six months a year, you know, that's something that has to be taken into account. However, for 10, 15% of a portfolio, especially for people that are investing more longer term, it's, it's something that should be allocated towards, we believe, and it doesn't have to be a risky investment. Um, what it does do is that we think it's very well risk adjusted. So I guess a key for any financial advisor is, you know, what, what return are they delivering per unit of risk? So you could have a alternative investment that only delivers, let's say, 8%. But what is the risk they're taking relative to the risk-free rate? And that's something that has to be thought about. And we have to do a good job as an industry in educating the financial advisors. So in terms of delivering return per unit of risk-free return, we want to focus on the portfolio itself and being a portfolio stabilizer, a portfolio diversifier. We're not saying you can't do 60-40. We're not saying bonds are dead or equities are dead. But I think you know equities are priced pretty dearly right now. Um, and we think alternatives should be a factor in a diversified portfolio. The risk is obviously all alternatives are not created equal. All alternative investment managers are not the same. They all do view risk a little bit differently. So going back to that risk, risk spectrum, they will take different types of risk. Um, we hear a lot of times uh, the newest manager out there, oh, this new fund XYZ is right out there. I'm going to allocate to them. Okay, well, they're new. That could be, they could be good. Don't get me wrong. But would you rather have someone who's maybe been cycle tested, has been investing through the global financial crisis or even during COVID? So again, it's like anything else. It's no different than a stock. Um, yes, there's some good brand names out there. Is the brand name good at all types of investing? I would submit not necessarily. I want to know who the portfolio managers are, what their track record is, how they're deploying leverage, um, how they view risk, how they view the return, and, I'm, and I'm, am I as an investor getting paid for that? How can advisors access your strategy? So tell us a little bit about your interval fund and your business development corp. Our BDC, we launched about 11 years ago. Uh, we raised about $1.1 billion through the um, independent broker-dealer and RAA network. Again, average ticket size at $35,000, $40,000, just going door-to-door -door and educating these people. Um, we since listed that BDC on the New York Stock Exchange, um, ticker symbol um, CION, uh, uniquely enough. Um, so that, what we did, that, that was kind of the first iteration of the BDCs. Now the BDCs kind of mimic the interval fund where they give some quarterly liquidity, although that liquidity could be turned off. When we raise money, we, in, we invested that money over a long period of time, over about six, seven years, and then we listed on the stock exchange to give those investors liquidity. BDCs, as you and your listeners probably know, is it's a, it's a great structure, um, but it is sector specific. That sector tends to be US middle market. By statute, over 70% of the assets um, have to be basically US middle market or um, under $250 million of market cap if you're gonna be publicly traded. Our interval fund called the Scion Aries Diversified Credit Fund is a globally diversified credit fund. So we invest not just in private credit, US middle market, we invest in European middle market, we invest in broadly syndicated loans, we invest in some bonds and some CLO tranches and some real estate and some special situations. Basically accesses um, the, the private credit platform or the credit platform, I should say, of Aries and gets the kind of the best products that they see. Um, so again, it's, it's not levered the same as a BDC. So in terms of risk, BDCs tend to be levered higher. This is levered lower. BDCs tend to focus more on the US. This, our product, the interval fund, tends to focus more globally, but they're both very good products that we think are, uh, you know, should be, should be taken a look at by financial advisors. And what, as an interval fund, how does the gating work? Is it there, they have the option to uh, request quarterly uh, withdrawals? What, what is the limit on the liquidity? Um, in our interval fund, it's 5% per quarter, 5% of the net asset value. Um, we're proud to say we've never, knock wood, come close to that number. So every investor who's wanted to get out up to now has been able to get out. Um, and again, if for whatever reason they can't get out, they get out pro rata, and then hopefully next quarter they could get out. Um, so again, that's the way it works. And you know, some people may be scared of that. 
which is why it's about education, which, you know, the financial advisor has to tell the uh, their client, listen, there is a chance, notwithstanding what I just said, that for six and a half years, every investor who wanted to get out got out. There is a chance you may not be able to get out that quarter. But what is the benefit of that? The benefit of that is the investment manager will not have to be a forced seller, will not have to keep a lot of cash on hand that drag down returns. Quite frankly, and as you know as well as I, retail investors often sell at the worst times. So in a way, hey, you know what? It may not be the worst thing that you couldn't get 100% of your money out when you panicked uh, and wanted it out. Um, so that's kind of the beauty of the wrapper. But again, as I mentioned, we, uh, we're fortunate enough that we haven't been gated yet. And I think, by the way, I keep saying gated. Gated is the wrong term. Because to me, gating is like when gates come down. And no, this you know going ahead, going in, that there's only 5% there that's available for you. So it's no gate coming down. This is what's available to you. And we built a structure around that. Talk a little bit more about the composition of the interval fund now in terms of its holdings. You mentioned that it can hold private credit. It can be diversified globally. It can be participated in loan syndications or CLOs. Where, where is the, where's the bulk of it invested now? The bulk of it, uh, ironically enough, as per your opening comments, is in private credit and is in the U.S. middle market. Uh, I think about 60% is U.S. middle market private credit. I think another 15% is European private credit. So if you look at, look at access private credit assets, um, you can do it in pretty much two ways. The BDC structure, BDCs are still deemed alternative investments from a regulatory perspective. In a lot of cases, they require um, a sub doc and signature um, to access, although there are certain fintech platforms out there that we discussed that, that smooth that process out. Um, but certain of the platforms and states limit how much of these alternative investments you can access. Whereas because of the interval funds, it is essentially a mutual fund. It doesn't have those state, those state limitations and those platform limitations. So it's a great way to access private credit in a wrapper that's not a, a business development company. But as, as you pointed out, we do have about 5%, 10% in bonds. We do have broadly syndicated loans. And the beauty of the strategy is we could dynamically allocate. If there's a correction, if there's something's oversold, the portfolio managers can go out and sell one asset and buy another one. So they're dynamically allocating across the credit platform, excuse me, where they see the best relative value. Are there any other questions that I'm not asking when it comes to the BDC or the interval fund that you're typically hearing from advisors? No, I think uh, I think you did a good job and you asked a lot of the questions. I really uh, want to thank you for having me, though. It's been, uh, been great. I appreciate it. If there's one key takeaway that you would like to leave with our audience of advisors about the diligence that they should perform on a product like yours, an unlisted interval fund, what would that be? Yeah, listen, I think the one thing is, you know, spend five, 10 minutes learning about the product. All BDCs are not the same. All interval funds are not the same, just like all stocks are not the same, right? Um, all investment managers are not the same. And just because you have a big brand name and they might be great in one asset class, they might not be good at another asset class. So listen, I think we're probably in the second or third inning of this nine inning game of retail investors accessing alternatives there's going to be a lot more investment managers trying to access the space. Some will be good. Some will not be good. And it's going to be incumbent on financial advisors to, to take the time and learn a little bit about the products. Well, thank you. And we'll include a link to the Scion website. Will you be able to learn more about Michael and his firm and the Interval Fund and the Business Development Corporate Corporation that it offers? Michael, is there anything else you'd like to add? Nope. I appreciate the time, though. Thank you very much, and uh, look forward to being back. You're welcome. We'd love to have you back. And thank you for listening to the Gaining Perspective podcast with Bob Hoopscher, today featuring Michael Reisner of the Scion Investment Group. To support our podcast, please share, subscribe, or leave a review to help make our podcast more findable for your friends and colleagues. You can subscribe to Gaining Perspective on your favorite podcasting service.